Welcome to Teams Tuesday, a podcast about mastering the best about what other people have already figured out. Teams Tuesday focuses on insights and lessons that never expire. You will walk away from every episode with actionable insights that help you get better results and be more productive. This was about as bizarre and easy as it gets. The client just couldn't make up their mind. I feel like we had top, top, top. Went from a project of 20 weeks to just two. The DevOps was a cultural shift. This is Teams Tuesday with your host, Peter Ward. Welcome to Teams Tuesday. My name is Peter Ward. I am the Teams Tuesday host. I'm live here in New York City. But today we have a another MVP, Peter Van Stra. He's actually from the UK or living in the UK, but he's actually from Holland. So welcome and thank you for being our guest here on the meetup, Peter. Thank you very much uh, for uh, for having me here uh, today. You're living in Milton Keynes, which is how many miles is that from London? Uh, it's probably about 30, 35 miles, I think. It's somewhere mm-hmm. over there. I would probably more know it in travel minutes, so the trains take about 45 minutes. All right, so tell me about your family. Okay, you're living in Milton Keynes. What are your hobbies and what's your job title? I've got lots of hobbies still. Basically, I've got two two boys uh, and a wife. And uh, the two and boys, they, oh, well, a little bit almost. The, the boys, basically, they, they, they play their football uh-huh. and I basically coach both of their, uh, their, their football teams. So one of them plays in the under 11s and one plays in the under 13s. And it means that you've got two teams to coach, uh, which can be quite a challenge on a Saturday morning. So it means that one plays really early and one plays a little bit later on the Saturday morning. And well, that basically yeah. covers my whole Saturday. OK, so your boy, is this where you've got your this Teams Tuesday title from with the power apps for children? Yes. Yeah, basically. Uh, basically, roughly two years ago, when the whole COVID thing started, we basically ended up in lockdowns and those kind of things. And then with a now colleague, uh, Rory Neary, we basically uh, we both set up uh, Power Apps for Kids. And we started with, I think, bi-weekly sessions where we were showing little apps that were relevant to kids. It could either be a game where basically the kids would enjoy playing the Power App, or it could even be that the kids basically develop their own power apps and later on basically during a demo I'll show you a couple of things that my kids developed uh, over the time and the thing is it's quite nice to see basically that journey where you have the beginning of the first touches of becoming a developer almost and uh, and then developing your own little apps and then suddenly my kids went oh we can create another app and we can create an app over here or and so and so on and everything became an app and you find the same in business, don't you? I work for a company in um, uh, near uh, Northampton, a little bit north of Milton Keynes, and the company's called Hybrid Services. Yep. And over there, uh, I'm a uh, principal architect. And you find basically my clients they have the same process where they start with an app. Okay, might not be a game. <laughs> they, most of the times they go for business applications, and it's far too complicated as a beginning app because that first step it's really useful. If you can take the small steps. And I think that's the big difference between when we went for Power Apps for Kids and when we got adults trying to learn the Power Platform. The, the adults want to take 100 steps well, first. And they well, have yeah, to well, that's the whole thing. Client, everyone likes to overcomplicate these things. Yeah, exactly. And it's and the thing is, kids go, oh, that's really nice. That's I can do something. And it basically makes it quite an amazing experience, I think, for them for us so you've actually got your children now doing the whole power apps sort of like oh yes yeah definitely definitely right, okay they they love it maybe get a power app for them to do their homework uh, well uh, one of the apps that i will show you later on is actually one of their homeworks that they had to do and the teachers were quite impressed that he basically delivered his homework with an app that's, that's actually pretty impressive okay so what does a typical day look like for you uh, so basically, as an as a consultant architect, I've got pretty much two types of jobs. I've got one is is that pre-sales where you, you talk to the customer what they need to do and have it, you create projects in effect. But I also do a lot of delivery, so that means I'm basically doing the projects that I created before in in, in the pre-sales phase quite often, or some of my colleagues do it, or I help my colleagues to get the projects delivered, or quite often even I help my clients to just get it get them to deliver projects themselves. But additionally to that, basically, you one of the things that 
I'm really active on is my my personal blog. It's called yep. Siapains. You can find I'm it on siapains.com. Yeah, good, good. Um, and lots of people do. And on that blog, basically, I have got that little little chat thingy uh, that, that that will appear saying, "Hello, I'm here. If you need any help, uh, let let me know." And during a day, during a working day, I probably get about 10, 15 people every day asking me for help. Very quick little question and answers sometimes just about, oh, I can't do whatever it may be. It can be as simple as how do I create a SharePoint list or how do I record a Teams call or whatever. Those kind of things happen quite a lot. And sometimes it's, it's about bigger work where people go, I'm completely st stuck. Can you help me? Typically with, uh, with, with Power Automate, you mm -hmm. find that but Power Automate comes closer to that development world, I think, than Power Apps does. Power Apps is quite often you just add a couple of elements in and then you code like you would do in Excel. Well, lots of people have managed to do that. OK, lots of people still need help with it, but but that's a, that, that's a whole different thing. Power Automate is a bit more abstract, I think. Right. Well, it's funny, actually, I actually wrote a blog article recently about why learn to code. Because everyone is saying we all need to code, we all need to code. If you look at a lot of the message from these tech companies like Microsoft, it's all no code or low code yep. solutions. Yeah, definitely. Uh, so I think there's a little bit of a mixed messaging going on here. Yeah, a little bit. But the thing is, that you find I think that when you, they, they basically call them citizen developers quite often. I find it the wrong term because it, it's a bit downgrading what people do, I think. But, but <laughs> I think there's no difference between a developer and a developer, other than that they have a different background quite often. When I use Power Apps to develop my apps, I do a lot of coding in it. And there isn't too much of a difference between the real, what people call real coding, and so C Sharp or whatever other code, uh, language, and actually when you develop in Power Apps, uh, you can make Power Apps just as complicated, just as whatever you need it to do. I think that's where the low code platform can actually do a lot higher code, if you want to call it like that. Right. Um, what was your first job out of college then? Basically many, many years ago. Uh, it's, uh, uh, I was probably about 24, I think. Um, I basically um, um, actually moved to a company in the UK then, and uh, one of my friends was working there. Uh, one of my English friends, and um, he basically said, well, would you like to come around over here uh, and, and, and help us on our help desk? And it was basically a company that was called uh, OSM, and I don't think a company exists anymore, but they were looking after Unix, and I was basically on the help desk, helping customers with uh, with their problems with Unix. We had a couple of products that would help them, and it's a thing nowadays, it's Unix is becoming less and less important. Everything's taking over by, uh, by Windows, but there is still a Unix world there. There's still plenty oh, of applications that run on yeah, Unix or Linux. Isn't, Un isn't Linux a flavor of yeah. Unix? Yeah, definitely. Um, so, uh, it's just one of the many, isn't it? OK, um, yeah. And then am I correct? Isn't Android a flavor of Linux? Oh, I don't, don't know. It could quite well be. Oh, okay. um, Android I, might, is a bit, I might be wrong on that statement. That's a bit of a guess. Yeah, I don't know. It could quite well. I could, it could be. You find, I think, that the whole Unix world, I think, was very important and it has set a lot of the base, I think, of IT. It's just a little bit, I think, less strong at the end user side of the world. It's it's a server end. It's probably better than Windows, maybe. But end user side, it's never got there and probably doesn't need to either. Right. Yeah, I've just, I've just done a quick Google search. Android mobile operating system is based on a modified version of the Linux kernel. Ah, okay. Other sources. Well, you learn something every day. And what year were you doing Unix? I must have been 24. So, yeah, it's probably half my life ago. Must have been 1996, I think. Well, right, okay. And what you don't tell me, what was your first version of SharePoint? That, that's a bit more recent. In, uh, in 2007, I actually lived for a couple of years back in Holland uh, then. I worked for a company then, and they were interested in moving their document management system to SharePoint. That was in 2007, um, when SharePoint actually finally, I think, became a real thing. Uh, the earlier versions, I think, were great for developers, but a bit of a battle. And I think 2007 was the first one, I think, which really got into into the market, I think. Yes, two, SharePoint 2007 was definitely, you had the info path, proper engine, you, you know, it was all much more, it got rid of content server. 2003 yeah. didn't even have a workflow engine. Yes, I totally agree. Okay, what was your last challenging project that you did? Quite, quite a few challenging projects throughout the years, of course. But one of the things that I should probably include, I think, here is that a couple of these migration projects. 
when you migrate, this typically I think for SharePoint projects, you migrate from, from a file system over to SharePoint and OneDrive and all that other, other stuff uh, may be there. And the typical thing is that those file systems are very poor quality quite often. Those servers can't handle the migration tools sometimes. So what you quite often need to do, quite often you first start with the migrations and you see how it goes. You migrate a little bit and see if that it, if servers can handle it. But quite often basically you find that these servers, they just can't handle it. Recent project that I did, we basically had to upgrade the servers first, add extra memory and, and whatever other stuff into it before we could even start with the migration. And once we've done all of that, we could do the migration, but then the tools were so fast that it would hang up their DNS environment. And with the meant basically, when you run the migration, the DNS server would basically hang up that whole intranet. And what, what migration yeah. tools were you doing? You using? Oh, uh, basically in the, in the recent, well, half year roughly, I, I started using the SharePoint Migration Manager and I first started with SharePoint Migration Tool, which is a standalone little tool that you just run wherever you like. But the SharePoint Migration Manager is really good because you can um, migrate it using just the admin center. So where sometimes clients, they have these uh, difficult ways to log on to a server somewhere. You have to go through all sorts of hoops and remote uh, connections and whatever else. This bit you can just do from your admin center. So if your admin center just lives within your local browser somewhere, you quickly go to the browser, you say uh, import these jobs, these migration jobs, and all your file systems can be imported like that. And it can be very quickly, where in the past I would use third party products, but, but now basically it's SharePoint Migration Manager, it's just as good, I think. It's fast. Okay, the UI is not 100%, I think. I think there's still some improvements that could be made, but do I want to spend a lot of money on buying a UI to migrate files that can be migrated to the SharePoint migration tool? Nah, I'm happy with the SharePoint migration tool. What? It just does it. And you know, free. in terms, you know, in terms of share, you got a couple of like ShareGate. Which ones do you yep. prefer? Metalogix. Um, which ones do you prefer? AvPoint. Which ones do you prefer? I've, I've used all of them. I think ShareGate is probably, I think, the most common, commonly used one, and it's probably the one I think where clients would go to first. But I've even had in a recent project where the client was already ready to purchase ShareGate. And I was thinking, well, this is such a small migration. You don't really need to worry about it. Just use the SharePoint migration tool and it will do the job for you. I'm not saying that you should never ever use products like ShareGate anymore. I'm, I'm, I'm sure there's still a, a, a good, good reason to do so. But I think SharePoint migration is getting close. Oh, right. OK. Is it? So I'm assuming this SharePoint migration, that sounds like a bit of a train wreck project. For you. It's yeah, it, it, it was um, uh, a challenge basically when a when a client has to upgrade their DNS servers and whatever else and get their network sorted out. Actually, uh, afterwards they were quite grateful, I think, because there was basically an issue there, and it wasn't really visible to them. Uh, they actually misconfigured some of their DNS servers and whatever else. So there was actually an issue there, but it wouldn't really be a problem until ser the servers were really well hammered and that's what the migration did for that. Um, so even though it broke something, at the end they were still a smiley, happy, a happy face, so uh, that's all, all right. good. What's your favorite M365 feature or tool? Personally, I like Microsoft Teams. Of course, SharePoint is still the thing that sits in the background and and if I look at the, the last many years, I've done so much SharePoint work, it's always something that you really like. I'm sure you will have the same thing as you're active within that SharePoint world as well. SharePoint is really all, all quite good. But then I think if I now look at what I'm most active with, it will become the Power Platform, I think, where the Power App stuff, of course, is really interesting because you can create something that's visible to, to lots of end users. And I quite like sitting in that end user world where I still talk to end users, to Power users or whatever. And but Power Automate is also one of those things. And I think all these products, they work so quite nicely together. You, where I think if you look at it, well, 15 years ago, you still had those people who just did SharePoint and they just did, did the CSS stuff because the SharePoint 2000 and whatever version needed to look exactly right. It needed to be pixel perfect like a website. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. There was this, I remember Heather Solomon, she was this SharePoint brander, and you know, she was yeah. like the guru person of the whole thing. 
Yeah. Uh -huh. Oh, definitely. I, I remember going to her site to find all the different elements on your SharePoint page. And, and then those were the bits you had to well rebrand. The branding part of the projects, they were always the painful part of the projects because they would break. Then your customer would have Internet Explorer or another browser or another browser. And hey, now it isn't pixel perfect in all of these browsers. And to me, it doesn't make much sense. I remember one of my colleagues always said that you all these clients want to brand SharePoint. Have you ever considered branding Word? Oh, well, you don't. Oh, it's a tool. Sorry. I, I, I would have clients and they would say to me, we're, we're branding with SharePoint. They would say they wanted either two, one or two things. They wanted to look nothing like SharePoint or yep. they wanted to look like the Apple website. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yeah, definitely. All right, so let's just look at your demo, okay? So you've done this demo, which is basically Power App for Kids. Okay, yes. so before you go in, like, what's the cool sizzle features that you're going to be showing us? Basically, what I want to show you is not just the apps. The thing is, apps you can probably uh, see on lots of these demos. You, know, you go to you, any conference. Yeah, you want to share I will, your screen. I will, you want to share yeah, your I, will, I, will, I will share my screen. Uh, share lots of different apps and explain to you how these apps all work and whatever else. But I think it's more about the journey, the journey that somebody can take. And in this case, basically, they were my kids who took this journey. And I want to first basically show you the first app that I developed with them. And it was very simple and it's a sums app. So very much like in a school kind of environment. We even put a nice little image in the background so it looks like a school kind of environment. And I will run this app first so you can see what, uh, what it looks like. So I've got this easy sum over here. It's one times three. Well, everybody knows it's four. Ah, and it's, I, I got it wrong. So I still get an unhappy face up here. But if I get it right, I get a happy face over there. So again, I get a new new uh, sum and yep, I, yep. Uh, I get the idea. Interval. exactly it, it continues like that. So and if you look at this, basically from a coding perspective, it's not complicated in any kind of way. So it's it's very, very good for for children to learn how to code. So all we're doing over here basically is one number, another number, multiply them. And is that equal another number? So one number, one number, and a third number. And do, does, do things match? And if they match, we show the smiley face, and we've also got an unhappy face image over there, and it will show you one or the other. And when we, we actually recorded how to create this whole app, and we stuck it on Twitter, and I got two MVPs who never done any power apps before. They basically contacted me saying, ah, that's a really good app, and it really got me into power apps. So success, I would say. Getting children into Power Apps is slightly harder because you don't really have an easy way of well, contacting them. You don't even want to contact them. Let's put it that way. But if you can get it into adults, where adults go, hey, actually, I like this, and and they then teach uh, these kind of things to their kids, hey, that's good enough for me. So this was basically their first little app and very simple coding. And then we took it basically to the next level. You know the game uh, Noughts and Crosses or Tic Tac Toe, oh, yes. they call it in America? Well, that's basically what we created over here. And you can see basically over here, it's slightly different, but it's okay. My kids basically didn't like the knots and the crosses, so they put some images. Uh, so they had cows and they had bunnies and created a similar kind of game up oh, over there. And you can see over there, it's a smiley face thing that comes around again. It's the same kind of logic where uh, the smiley faces appear when a certain condition is, is true or or whatever. But it's it, the whole game is a little bit more complicated, isn't it? Because you can also restart the game and you can see over here it, it tells you whose turn it is. And it, so it's basically it, it's almost just like the sums app. At the next level, and it's a very simple little game, isn't it? So yeah, yeah totally. And then basically we started getting into homework. <laughs> well, sometimes these uh, children have to do homework and looking at one of my kids. Yeah, I know. One of my kids, basically, they had to create a planet model. So lots of you find lots of parents that turn up with, with, with all these these bubble things and they're all connected with wires or whatever at school. And it's really difficult to, to walk it over to school. Um, in our place, basically, we can just walk to school. It's about a five minute walk or so. And you see lots of planets over here. Some of the planets go one way around. Some planets go another way around. And this is all power apps. This is not a single image. This is lots of different images and what he actually did is that when you click on it, you can get now facts. So I just clicked on Mars. I didn't know it was Mars, but hey, it's it's Mars and it gives me some details about Mars. And I can click information about the sun or whichever planets you want. And 
like you can see, it's quite difficult to click on these kind of planets. So then you also put the pause button in. Um, and so you can uh, click on all the different bits of information. And this app is actually very different from the previous two apps. One of the nice things, I'll, I'll quickly show you this, but when you move things around in Power Apps, different objects and whatever, you would need to know a little bit about uh, cosinuses and sinuses and whatever else, which is complicated. Well, my son, he was, uh, I think, nine years old when he put this one together. Um, with not too much help at all. And what basically I explained to him is that when you've got a cosinus or a sinus or whatever, you get, it generates your numbers between zero and one. Yep. So that means that you can have that, the zero and the one become your extremes of most left, most right, most top or most bottom. And now if you calculate the x's and y's, so, See, a nine-year-old doesn't need to understand what a cosinus really means. They just need to know it means that it generates me a number that sits between one and zero. Mm -hmm. And if I if I use that and I multiply that by, by the distance, for example, I'm going to make a circle. Or actually, if I calculate the y, I'm making something that moves from left to right. And if you do the same thing for the y, but in a slightly different uh, direction. You noticed earlier there was a minus over there, and over here there's just a plus. So one goes plus, and one other goes minus. You find that it goes in opposite directions, and you actually go and get expression over here of the sun is over here, the distance that Jupiter's got, and then a little bit of cosine and stuff with a number that somebody generated, and it will just move along. And then he he actually figured out how do I make a planet move the other way around? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and so it does kind of things. It's actually quite complicated. Where did but you get the graphics from? I use oh. a lot of graphics on Google or something. Yeah, he just downloaded them. He just goes to Google. He and he he, he finds images, finds these moving images. It's even better, I think, than if you just have st static images. You can see over here the world is more. Uh, no, it's not. This is the world. So the world over there is just spinning around. Um, and he found basically little GIF files for every single one of the planets. He quite enjoys basically the whole thing of of planets and. And, and space and whatever else. So this kind of app, basically we, we sent out a tweet and we included the school in it and whatever else. And I think it hit about 10,000 views of that little video. Uh, so lots of people uh, people uh, really liked it. It's probably one of the most popular tweets in the family, I think. Um, <laughs> yeah, he, he beat me by a big time. And then basically recently, plenty earlier, basically we've got all these apps, basically we used them on Power Apps for Kids. And on Power Apps for Kids, we, we quite often show little games. And my son basically built and connect four game completely from scratch. Wow. Um, and this is basically the art, I think, of Power Apps for Kids. We develop little apps, but try and get people who speak at the events to build them completely from scratch. So you could rebuild it. We record it and you can find the recordings on powerappsforkids.com as well. And then you can replay it. Are you are you running like some kind of a coding camp or power apps for kids at school it, or something? Yeah, uh, well, we, we haven't done them at schools at all yet. But the thing is, we've had the handicap, I think, of COVID sitting a bit in the way. But potentially we could mm -hmm. run them at uh, run it at schools. Wouldn't have a problem with that. Would be quite uh, quite good fun, I think. So far, basically, we've done them on a monthly basis. And then on a monthly basis, we basically show a couple of apps and we get people interested. And we had multiple times now we had children actually demo their apps, whatever they have created. And sometimes we use adults that uh, that uh, create their apps. But just something like this, basically over here, it's the same kind of principle again, where you can just play a game of Connect Four. And okay, I won't make it into a complicated game, but. You go and you get that same happy face thing again so you can see basically the game has got a lot more complicated and if yep. you actually look at the code over here it is a little bit more complicated okay um, but you so managed to you, build it in an hour have you ever thought about doing chess yeah basically uh, like i mentioned earlier we've uh, basically ra run the um, uh, the power apps for kids uh, with, with rory neary and he actually developed an, uh, a chess game as well i can't remember if, if, if it's completely finished or not but he at least started the whole thing off and pieces were able to move which is quite good. The thing I'm waiting uh, for actually is to create a game where you can play against Power Apps itself. 
So you don't play against a human being anymore. In this case, I clicked for both for red and, and yellows. But if you can create an app that actually starts to well think, that would be the next level, I think. Um, and would be quite interesting to do as well. Right, interesting stuff. Very cool. Good, good, good stuff on this. Okay. Well, what's next with your kids then? What do you got? What do you got lined up for them this weekend? <laughs> I think this weekend it's going to be football again. So we'll probably stand in the cold rain. Is this on your blog, by the way? Yeah, okay. you will find that basically the, uh, one of my kids basically developed uh, this uh, this Connect Four, and he actually created a blog post on it as well. And if I go to Power Apps. So you can see over here, basically, he created a full step-by-step -step guide on how to create that same game. Sure, um, can you put that in the so, chat? Be great. Yeah, yeah, I will do. So if you uh, if you want to build your own game, over here it's fully screenshotted and with all of the code included, which I thought is quite uh, quite uh, nice. So yep. you don't need to understand all the code, but you can copy paste, uh, especially at the copy and paste level. Then you can go through it and build your own game. Very cool. I will share that on the on the podcast all right so let's just wrap up a few things what was your first job at a school i was probably quite lucky I, th I would even say the first jobs inside school i think were probably quite good one of the things that we, we did that we did uh, at uh, my university is lots of these what they call industrial placements um where yeah. you work for half a year in one place and a half year in another place what and what university yep. did you go to i went to university based in groningen and one of my industrial placements or uh, final projects uh, is what they called it, was at the Greenwich University. Uh, so that was actually in the UK. And that's basically I how I, I started. I used to live in Greenwich. I used to live in oh, Greenwich. Oh, good, good. And I quite liked it in the UK and then got got my first job at OSM. Um, and then basically, well, stay here for a bit longer. And before you know it, it's uh, many years later. In terms of the SharePoint, what's your, your biggest nightmare project that you've worked on? And what did you learn on uh, it? Nightmare projects are difficult, I think, because in general, I try to just solve them. Other than those, those migration projects, basically, where things have have taken a bit longer than I expected, but I wouldn't straight away call that nightmare. Yeah, I've had probably a couple of projects where I think it was overly heavy on SharePoint and branding, and then finding out basically that you've implemented all the branding for a or Internet Explorer or whatever, and then suddenly they've got some Apple devices and it all needs to work on Safari and it needs to look identical. And you think, yeah, that's not never going to happen. Mm -hmm. So yeah, that's those those kind of things are, are quite uh, can but, be quite. But the dramatic. Apple integration part that's now been pretty much resolved, I think, in terms of like the Safari. I remember 2007, like InfoPath was a bit shaky with the Apple. Am I correct that in that statement that you know the Apple integration? browser and chrome it's been fairly resolved now yeah yeah it's been been pretty good i think but you still find i think that some of these clients still run on internet explorer and well, find yeah. oh, certain things don't work well, well file explorer we people love internet explorer because of the, the oh, yes. with document with the file explorer and that's going away and that's not supported okay so they, you know like oh no you know the last thing users want is oh you need to change my behavior yeah <laughs> yeah definitely Right, OK. What are you working on to become like a better developer consultant? Actually, I work on trying to do less and less developer work, less or not developer work. I, th I still do more and more developer work, but less coding. I think it's quite a challenge, I think, to to stick to the power platform where you can, where in the past, basically, I've used things like SPFX within the SharePoint world, but try and avoid it because even though I might be okay with SPFX and within that coding world, my client will almost definitely not be. And if I can deliver them a power app instead of SPFX, then they will be able to maintain it themselves. They will be able to look after it themselves. I don't need to worry about that magic of code that they have to look after when I'm gone kind of thing, when I've left their, their, their project. At that moment, it's purely theirs. And I think that's an important message, I think, that the whole power platform should give us anyway, where we want to let people do the work themselves. Microsoft keeps using that empowered word. It's, it just means that people need to be able to do their own job where possible. Right, OK, very cool. Where do you want to be in five years? Oh, where do I want to be in five years? Well, hopefully we are in, in a world without COVID, uh, at least. Well, um, uh, <laughs> that would be really good, I think. Um, where do you get your source of knowledge? 
Well, uh, Google is uh, one of my friends, or Bing, either of those. <laughs> I have to say it's the Microsoft world. But I think one of the sources of knowledge which is quite uh, weird is, is quite often my own blog even, where I, I write a lot of blog posts and quite a lot of times I don't exactly remember all my past blog posts anymore. And uh, quite often I Google for, for whatever it is and find my own posts back, which is quite often nice. <laughs> Vanity results. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> All right. OK. If there was one song that you could describe what SharePoint is, what would that be to you? Lots of people explain it as, as being Lego bricks, where you put all the bricks together. Because SharePoint itself doesn't do anything until you start putting all the different elements together. Although I must say, I think the current versions, I think, of SharePoint, they become completer. They are starting to work more towards what the end users possibly want. And if we then talk about a song that is relevant to it, well, it's another brick in the wall, isn't it? It's a big brick wall sometimes. Sometimes you bang your head against it and you need more bricks. And that, that's basically the Pink Floyd uh, song. Oh, OK, final question. OK, where can we find you? You can always find me on the Seattle's or you can on Twitter, where my first name, surname, no dots, no nothing in it. I put it in the chat. I'll yeah. post it across social media for you. Always good, good. That's, that's great. OK, Peter, our time is up. Thank you so much. Very entertaining and educational as ever. Thank you very much for your time as well. Take and care. Bye. Speak soon.